describe it, but I can contain it, can't keep it to myself. There aren't enough colors to paint the whole picture, not enough words to ever say what I found. Wonderful and
to lead us as we continue.
Someone in here is free. <laughs> Forever we're free. Whom the Son makes free is free indeed. Amen. Welcome to Easter Sunday 2024. If this is your first time to be with us at First Baptist, 
perfect day to pick for a first Sunday. And we'd like to say every Sunday is this exciting, but it's not. But I'm still glad you're here because <laughs> you've made it more exciting for us. And we ask all of our first-time guests to send us a text message to let us know this is your first time to worship. And you send it to the number on the screen, plug in the word guest, hit send. We'll send you a response asking you to give us some information about yourself. And we don't share it with anyone. We just want to get to know you better. But you get it started by sending that text. And after the service is over, I know everybody will probably be racing out to their cars, but we're asking you to take a moment to go to the Overlook, which is an area directly behind the worship center. And we don't have an Easter basket for you, but we've got an Easter bag for you, okay? We've got a <laughs> gift bag for every first-time guest. It's just got some special things we've tucked in there as a little expression of our gratitude that you came to FBA on Easter Sunday. I also would like to say how grateful we are for the thousands of people watching us on live stream, and I want to wish them a happy Easter. Would you join me as we wish them a happy Easter? Then I want to mention we have a required membership class for people who want to join our church. We call it First Class, and the next one of these we're having is on June the 2nd. And I was wanting to promote the next class we're having, but before today happened, that class already filled up. So we had to reach out and promote the June 2nd class. That's a good problem to have, but uh, we want to encourage you. Yeah, that's right. But we provide you with a complimentary lunch. It's right after the second service, but we need to know you're coming. So you register by going to our website. And then, you know, several years ago with the outbreak of COVID, the Lord really impressed it upon our hearts that, that First Baptist Atlanta needed to be part of the solution to provide Christian education for the families in our area. And we didn't know how this was going to happen. We, we thought that we might have to start one from scratch. And, and that's kind of amazing to think about all of the details you have to work through you don't have a curriculum, you don't have faculty, you don't have space, you don't have a budget, you don't have a board of directors, all of that kind of thing. And it just so happens there was a young school in the area that heard about the city trying to take some of our land some time back. And I was pleading from the pulpit for your help. And uh, so if you don't know what that was about, we'll tell you on another Sunday. But uh, <laughs> the chairman of the board of a small Christian school in, in our area uh, heard that Part of my vision was to have a Christian school. He contacted us and said, please don't start a new one. We'll give you ours. And because of that, Dunwoody Christian School is coming to First Baptist Atlanta. We are legally adopting them, and they will be a formal subsidiary of First Baptist Atlanta. And we are already making the... Are you excited about that? I'm excited about that. <laughs> We're already making investments in our facility to remodel. We're working with their board and their administrators to get all the classrooms ready, the STEM lab. There's a whole lot that goes into it. But we're going to have it all ready by July so they can open the doors for the academic 24-25 school year on August the 14th. So I'm asking you as a parent, if you've got kids and you're um, considering an alternative than the indoctrination centers where kids go and have their little minds like pieces of clay molded and shaped and indoctrinated into the group thing. It's time for Christ-centered, Bible-based education. So I want you to visit their website for the school where you can find out about admission, tuition rates, and all of that. Grandparents, you look into this, and if you know families in our area, it might not apply to you, but you need to share that website with someone because this is the time for us to make a difference. You know, Noah Webster, who's been called the schoolmaster to the nation, the father of American scholarship and education, some have even called him the forgotten founding father. He lived from 1758 to 1843 and wrote the American Dictionary that still goes by his name. He said, education is useless without the Bible. The Bible was America's basic textbook in all fields. God's Word contained in the Bible has furnished all necessary rules to direct our conduct. He went on to say this, In my view, the Christian religion is the most important and one of the first things in which all children under a free government ought to be instructed. 
That's why we have Dunn Woody Christian School coming to FBA, and we're very excited about it. Then I want to mention next Sunday, I'm starting a new series in this service called Preparing for the Global Reset. And we're going to walk through some key Bible prophecies to talk about what's happening with the global mindset and the global agenda that is sweeping nations of the world, including ours. So I encourage you to be back as we launch that new series. And then finally, I want to mention one more thing. This is the last normal Sunday that we're having here because tomorrow morning we start demolition in this room and there's going to be a big construction drape behind me. And the orchestra and choir next week will be down here and we're going through Extreme Makeover Church Edition. <laughs> so I'm asking you for your patience because uh, we rented this screen today, but we're getting a permanent one put in and it's going to take us the rest of this year to get our seats, our carpet replaced, and to put our new coffee commons and cafe right outside these doors. So I just need to know, are you going to hang in here with us through this? Please let me know that. Well, before I have prayer, I want to read from Matthew's gospel where he writes about what happened on the morning that Jesus was raised from the dead. And you're going to see this later on in the service, but I want us, want us to read it together where it says, After the Sabbath... As the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. And they ran to bring his disciples this word. Aren't you thankful he's alive? Hallelujah. <clears throat> Father, here we are adding our voices to the chorus of voices around this globe who were worshiping the risen Christ long before we rolled out of bed today. And we know that believers will continue worshiping you as this day comes to a close. We thank you that we worship a risen Savior. And Lord Jesus, we are here to praise you for your work on Calvary's cross, the shedding of your blood, and your triumph over death when you walked out alive, alive forevermore. Because you live, we can face tomorrow. Because you live, we can overcome our fears. Because you live, we have hope that perseveres over every obstacle in our lives. And how I pray that that resurrection hope would fill someone's heart this morning, whether they're in this room or watching online. Someone who needs a word of encouragement, a reminder that you love them, that you still have a purpose and plan for their lives. We pray that everything said and done in this service will speak that message to weary and empty hearts. And Father, I pray you'll fill this place with an excitement, a celebration, a willingness to stand to our feet and give you praise. For you alone are worthy of it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
was started in the garden, it was first in the tomb. It's all reversed, the apple, the curse, three days in the ground. Christ our Lord has risen, death could hold him down.
If we allowed ourselves, there'd be many reasons for which we should be scared today. Things in the world are very unstable. We see what's happening between Russia and Ukraine, and Vladimir Putin is threatening to deploy nuclear weapons, which would be a disaster for the whole world. We think about what happened recently in the United Nations at the Security Council, where China and Russia formed a coalition and swayed the votes to reprove Israel, to prevent Israel from finishing the job to route out terrorism from the surrounding regions. And then my heart is broken for the unrest on the African continent where our fellow Christians are being persecuted in the Sudan and Nigeria by Muslim fanatics. And you could repeat that story all across the region. And I also think about the unrest in our own nation right now, the things that we're dealing with that cause us to wonder what our future holds and how young people coming out of high school and even college are wondering if they'll ever be able to find a job and what interest rates will look like if they'll ever be able to buy their own first home or if they're going to be sentenced to being renters and tenants for the rest of their lives. There's a lot that scares us. And then if you're like me, the situation that occurred with the Baltimore Francis Scott Key Bridge where the barge took down the bridge. If you watch the video, it happened just like that. And my conspiratorial mind started thinking, was that really an accident? Unfortunately, um, that's how I think sometimes. But I read an article about hypotheticals that what if there were a concerted effort to do that to 10 significant key bridges around the country, that all in one day, the infrastructure for shipping and transportation could be brought to a halt? And what if Chinese or Russian hackers were able to disable the electric grid by hacking in electronically, and we all lacked power to, to fuel our lives on a daily basis. We probably, if we knew everything that we risked experiencing, would be afraid to wake up the next morning. But Easter Sunday is a time when we're reminded that Jesus has made it possible to live our lives without fear. Whatever is going on in the global stage, we can live without fear. Whatever is happening in Africa or in our own country, we can live without fear because Jesus Christ has conquered everything that is against us. Therefore, we can live our lives with confidence and without fear. I want to ask you to turn to an unlikely passage of Scripture on an Easter Sunday morning, and that's the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 1, as we talk about the reasons why we're not afraid. The reasons we're not afraid. The Apostle John, one of Jesus' 12 original disciples, is the author of this last book of the Bible. He also wrote the Gospel of John, the fourth book of the New Testament, and the three little letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, that bear his name. He, in writing this, was given this out-of-body experience where his soul was lifted from his earthly confines, and he was taken to heaven, and he was given the message of revelation and all these images and symbols and visions. We believe that by the time he is seeing this, experiencing this, feeling this, he's in his 90s, if you can imagine that. What would it be like to live into your 90s and then to have this type of a moment where God gives you so much you're overwhelmed and somehow it gets written down for believers throughout the ages to read like we're reading it today. And he had been exiled as a political prisoner to a little island in the sea called Patmos. It was a rock quarry island, so he was serving time as a political slave. In his 90s, he was considered such a threat to the Roman emperor Domitian, the most powerful man in the world, that he said, that pastor scares me. I'm sending him out to that island where they're quarrying rocks to be sent to the mainland. What a compliment to be given to an old man that the most powerful man in the world was scared of him and put him out on this remote island. And that's the man who's writing these words. And in the opening chapter of Revelation, in this out-of-body experience, John sees Jesus, but he looks different than he remembers having seen him when he followed him as one of Jesus' disciples. He is depicted with images and symbols, and he startles John. And we're picking up about halfway into John's description of what the glorified Christ in heaven looked like. In verse 16 of Revelation 1, it says, He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun, shining in its strength. 
And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. So in this description that we're seeing of the Lord Jesus, who we know it to be, He's holding in his right hand seven stars, and if you were to continue reading, you'd know those seven stars are the messengers of the seven local congregations who were the intended recipients of this revelation. I'd like to think that the seven stars really symbolize all of God's redeemed people, the church. They are clasped tightly in the hand of Jesus. And that's reassuring to me to know that I am clasped tightly in the hand of Christ. How about you? The devil may attack me, other people may come against me, but I am held safely in the palm of Jesus' hands. But in addition to this, it says, out of his mouth, John saw this sharp two-edged sword. And unlike the two-edged sword of Hebrews, speaking of the Word of God, this sword, the word for it, translated sword, describes a military instrument that was used and intended to inflict swift and decisive death on, on the opponent. So this is a a sword of warfare, a sword of vengeance and wrath. This is what is coming out of the mouth of Jesus as John sees him. And then John says that Jesus' face, his countenance was like the sun shining in its most brilliant form with nothing between itself and the one who's viewing it. And it was overwhelming to John, so much so that he fell down prostrate at the feet of this glorified, vengeful, and fierce Jesus Christ. He says, I fell as though I were dead. He felt that powerless and that lifeless. And just so you know, this is not an uncommon response to the revelation of God's presence and glory. We talked about it when we were reading the passage about the women seeing the angel come out and sit on the stone when it was rolled away. They fell down because the glory of God is awe-inspiring. The glory of God leaves you in a state of helplessness when you realize he is holy, I am not. He is infinite, I am finite. I am but a mere crumb before almighty God. Other people in scripture responded the way John is, falling down before Jesus Christ. And it's so reassuring to me that this glorified Christ, who's depicted as powerful and ready to consume his enemies with that two-edged sword coming out of his mouth, he now demonstrates to John by taking his right hand which was holding all of God's people in it, and he lets go of holding all of God's people long enough, long enough to comfort one of God's children. Aren't you glad God can do both at the same time? He can take care of all of his children at once, but when he needs to give us personal attention, he's willing to do that as well. And here Jesus takes his right hand and he soothes and comforts John, who's overwhelmed by the appearance of Christ. And this was Jesus' way of saying, John, you may see me as being this, this consuming and reigning Lord, but I want you to know I'm the same Jesus against whose breast you leaned on the night that I washed the disciples' feet. That's one of my favorite things that John wrote in his gospel in John 13, 23, is the night before Jesus died. John writes about himself saying, the disciple whom Jesus loved was leaning his head against the chest of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you and I might think that's weird in our day and time, but back then, that was an expression of warmth and affection in a healthy way. And it was Jesus' way of saying, I may look different, but I'm the same Jesus. I may be your Lord and the ruler of the universe now, but I'm still your close personal friend and your protector. I am so grateful that you and I have the privilege of joining John in being comforted by precious Jesus, our Savior and friend. So he's exalted, but he's still very personal. And these are the words that Jesus spoke to startled, astonished, shocked, and overwhelmed 90-something-year-old John laying out before his feet. He touched him on the back and said, do not be afraid. That was the simple command. Do not be afraid. Jesus was saying this for several reasons. First of all, I think Jesus was saying, do not be afraid of me. I'm the Jesus that you loved. And we believe now about 60 years have, have passed since John saw Jesus lifted back into heaven. And since John is now taken to heaven to see him face to face. But perhaps Jesus saying, don't be afraid, 
is his way of saying, John, I see you on this island. I see you probably wondering, is this the kind of reward you get for being one of my followers? Such that you're spending your final season and days of life in misery out in this hot and humid island that is a workplace for servants? But you need to know there's no need to be afraid of your circumstances. My eyes are always on you. Do not be afraid. Then I think about the first readers of the book of Revelation. They would have been the people who showed up on the Lord's Day to hear it read in one of those seven cities where these churches were located that are listed in chapters 2 and 3. Our first century Christian predecessors lived in adverse and hostile circumstances where the Roman Empire hated them, other religious groups hated them, and many of them were martyred. Their lives were taken from them because they refused to recant their faith. So many of our Christian ancestors have lived with much less comfort and convenience than we have, much less cultural acceptance than most of us have enjoyed throughout our Christian life. And maybe Jesus' words to John not only comforted John, but when the first hearers and audience of this letter heard those words, maybe those words became personal to them. And what I want to share with you today is that the words of Jesus, no matter what your circumstances may be, do not be afraid. Those words are spoken to you as well. No matter how fearful you are, no matter how hopeless you are, no matter how insurmountable the obstacles that you're facing may be, no matter which relationships have been broken, no, ma no matter how much money you've lost and how much debt that you've gained, you need to know that the words of Jesus to John can be your words. Do not be afraid. It's been about two years ago, I was listening to this preacher on the radio, and I heard him say, there are 365 times in the Bible where God says, do not be afraid. He may say, stop being afraid, or fear not, or here in Revelation 1, do not be afraid. But if you do the math, and I think you want to fact check me here, if that's true and that command, don't be afraid, appears 365 times in the Bible, I believe that's one for every day of the year. There's a do not be afraid for every single day of your life in a calendar year. So that means God's got a promise for you. You don't ever have to be overwhelmed by the circumstances or by the opposition. Do not be afraid. So I want to walk through quickly some reasons why John shouldn't be afraid and why you and I shouldn't be afraid. And they're from the words that Jesus speaks to John after that command not to be afraid. Are you ready? Here's the first one. The reason we don't need to be afraid is because Jesus is greater than time. You say, what in the world do you mean by Jesus being greater than time? He says in verse 17, I am the first and the last. Did you see that? What in the world does that mean? Well, first of all, before we explain what it means, we have to know where it came from. Jesus is reaching back as the book of Revelation contains so many references to the Old Testament. So in Jesus' description of himself as the first and the last, he's borrowing from what Yahweh, Father God, said about himself through the, through the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah 44 and verse 6, Isaiah records God's word where it says, Thus says Yahweh, the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. So there you have it in the Old Testament. God says, I'm the first, I'm the last. 700 years before Christ came to the world. Isaiah 48 and verse 12, God says, Listen to me, O Jacob, and Israel my called. I am he, I am the first, I am also the last. So Jesus calling himself the first and the last here in the book of Revelation, he is attributing to himself the words that were spoken by Yahweh and Isaiah. And in, in a sense, he's saying, I am equal and fully God with the Heavenly Father. There is no mistaking the message of Revelation that Jesus is not only the Son of God, Jesus is God the Son. Jesus is indeed God. By calling himself the first, what he's saying is he is before all things. By calling himself the last, he will endure beyond all things. Time itself is his creation. It's hard for us to think of time as a creation. Just like the sun, the moon, the stars, planet earth, the galaxy, the universe. Time itself, the ticking of time is 
a created aspect of God's creation. God created it. God is sovereign above it. Time is under his feet, which means anything that causes us to be afraid happens within time, does it not? But Jesus Christ is the first and the last. He is above time. He created time, and everything happening within time is subject to his authority. So what I'm telling you is we have no need to be afraid because Jesus is greater than time, and everything that happens to us happens within time. Oh, that ought to get an amen right there. I mean, the thing about it is, it's, it's as though Jesus is saying by, by, by saying I'm the first, I'm the last. He is the bookends on eternity, but eternity has no bookends. There's never been a time when he was not. And there will never come a time when he ceases to be. He is eternal in the past. He is eternal into the future. He is infinity embodied. Jesus said, I'm the first and the last. But he goes on to say this, and this is another reason why we shouldn't be afraid. He is the true and living one. That's what he calls himself. I am he who lives. Look at it in verse 18. Another translation puts it this way. I am the living one. I like that translation because throughout the Old Testament, the reference to God as the living God is, is depicted in contrast to the idols and the lifeless gods of the pagan people, the people who worshiped other gods than the God of Israel. And I want to make it clear today, there are still people worshiping many gods. They may not be confined to statues and idols and to shrines, but they are gods nonetheless because they claim control over people's lives. And anything that claims control over someone's life is a god of sorts. But when it comes to true God, he is the only one and there is no other. And Jesus says, I am the living one. All other so-called gods are dead, lifeless, and mere figments of man's imagination or seeds planted into the minds of man by demonic forces. God is the only God. We are a church that preaches one God. We are what you call a monotheistic people. We don't believe in multiple gods. We don't believe in many ways to God. There is only one God and only one way to that God, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. In Psalm 42, it says, As the deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, comma, what does it say? The the living God, when shall I come and appear before him? Jeremiah 10 and verse 10 says, But Yahweh is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting king. At his wrath the earth will tremble and the nations will not be able to endure his indignation. So throughout the Old Testament, two examples. He is the living God, the living God, the living God, the living God. Jesus standing in heaven now. John looking up and hearing him. Jesus says, I am the living one. I'm the only one. And so therefore, because he is the living one, the true and living God, it means that he is king of kings, Lord of lords, and there is nothing against you that is any match for his power. He's the living one, the only one. Here's a third reason why we should not be afraid, why you should not be afraid, and that's because Jesus loved you enough to die for you. He loved you enough to die for you. He says it here in verse 18. I want you to look at it. He says, I am he who lives, comma, and was dead. He's referring to the cross 60 years after it happens while he's up here in heaven and John is receiving this revelation. Now, if I were Jesus, I think I'd want to have that as far in the rearview mirror as possible. I don't know about you. I don't like, I don't like thinking about negative memories. Sometimes stuff will come up on my phone and memory and I remember that was a terrible day I'm deleting that out of my uh, phone a lot of people have Facebook memories come up a lot of times it's happy what comes up and a lot of times you're like strike so I want to find out how to turn memories off you know what I'm saying but but uh, but here's Jesus he's up here in heaven and he's saying yeah I, I left heaven went to earth died on the cross I am he who is alive but was dead he's still talking about it up there there must be a reason and what this reveals to us is the humility of Jesus. 
the servant's heart of Jesus. I, I mean, when you stop to think about it, you know he existed with God, as God, before he came down here and was born of Mary, right? He's always existed. It, it was just at Bethlehem that we see him clothed like us. And just putting on our clothes with human skin was a sign of humility, was it not? The uncontainable, incomprehensible second member of the Holy Trinity limited himself to fit within the sleeve of a human body. That took humility. And to do so for 33 years, hiding his glory, veiled behind the curtain of skin. So he humbled himself through, through incarnation, but if that weren't enough, he humbled himself through crucifixion. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8, the Apostle Paul says, In being found in appearance as a man, Jesus, what did he do? He, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of, of the cross. Not just any kind of death, by the way, but a means of death, crucifixion that was reserved for hardened criminals. The worst of society. That is the death before which he humbled himself and allowed them to pierce his body to that tree. And it's still being talked about. He said, I am he who lives, comma, and was dead. That's the cross. He's still talking about it. And throughout the book of Revelation, there are continual references to the death of Jesus or to the blood of, of Jesus. So that kind of clues me in on the fact that if you're not comfortable talking about the cross, what you're going to do in heaven, they're still talking about it in heaven. And I heard about a church, by the way, that did, did a marketing campaign where they're going to stop talking about the blood because they don't want to make people feel uncomfortable who are visitors coming to their church who have to hear about the blood. And you know what I say to that? Blood, 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 blood. That's what I say to that. The blood, the blood, the blood, the blood of Jesus, the cross of Jesus, the shed blood of the Lamb of God on Calvary. That's how we're saved. And there's this picture, if you fast forward from the first chapter of Revelation, where John is drawn into the throne room of God, and Almighty God the Father is seated on the throne of power, and he's got a scroll in his hand. And they're saying, who is worthy to walk up to God and take that sacred scroll out of the hand of the Father? It says they looked in heaven, they looked on earth, under the earth. Who is worthy? Who is worthy? Who is worthy? And then John writes in the fifth chapter, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. That tells me that even what Jesus looks like in heaven, there are reminders that he's the one who was slain. Even the visible appearance of Jesus bears the marks of Calvary. We will never stop praising him for his death on the cross. We will never stop praising him in heaven for his shed blood. He never stops talking about it, neither will we. And so what did the lamb do? The lamb who had been slain, what must this have looked like? We can only guess, but in figurative language, John sees the lamb going up to God, taking the scroll. And when the lamb takes the scroll from the Father, this is Jesus taking it from God. All of heaven just rejoins in this huge celebration of musical worship. In chapter 5 and verse 9, it says, They all started singing a new song, saying, You are worthy to take that scroll and to open its seals for you were slain, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You see what they were saying to the lamb? You are worthy. Why did they say he was worthy? Because he was slain, because of his blood that has redeemed us. And I want to say something else. That's what happens in heaven 24-7. Everyone who gets there cries out, worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Precious are you, Jesus, for taking the hit for me. We are redeemed by your blood without which we would not enter heaven's gates. You're not going to get up there and say, well, I was Baptist or I was Methodist or I was Catholic and we never got too excited in our church services. You better figure out how to get excited because when you get over there, it's going to be worthy, worthy, worthy. Praise the Lamb of God falling down and praising him on high. 
All these people say, well, I'm just not too comfortable. I've heard people say, I'm not comfortable when people start standing up at First Baptist and start raising their hands. Get over it. Get over it. We're praising the Lord. He is worthy. He's worthy of our praise. You're not going to get up to heaven and have you some little refined, quiet, frozen, chosen worship service. We're going to cry, worthy, 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 and we'll sing it for a thousand years. And when that's over, we'll sing it for 10,000 more because he is worthy. He's worthy. So you shouldn't be afraid because he's worthy. There's something about praise. When you get some praise up in you, that praise will send the devil packing. It will. When you just, and I, that's what I do. I deal with anxiety. Some of y'all know that. I need help. I'm, I need meds. I need counseling. <laughs> you know what I do? I get my little Bose Bluetooth speaker in my house. I crank up my praise music. And my house that was filled with fear becomes a sanctuary of praise, filling it with the praises of Jesus. Oh, yeah. Man, I'm telling you, none of that was in my notes. <laughs> Something's come over me. I'm tell, I, was trying to st I was trying to stay right behind. Them. And I'm telling you, I was trying to stay right here behind my new little table that they got up here. But I just can't help it. He's worthy. And all of heaven says it right now. Boy, if we could listen to him, that's what they'd be saying. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy are you, Lord Jesus. Here's another reason we must not be afraid. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. Jesus arose and will never die again. He'll never die again. Look at verse 18. He says, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And then he even says, Amen. <laughs> Amen. Now, that's what Easter's about, because alive forevermore means, yes, he, he was dead, but he rose and he's alive forevermore. We're, we're here to celebrate that today. If he did not rise from the dead, everything we're doing right now is a farce. My preaching is a farce. Your faith is a farce. It's a hoax. It's a scam. It's the biggest scandal in religious history in all the world. Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 15, 14. If Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. You're just worshiping some dead guy. But you see, he's not dead. He's alive forevermore. And it not only means that, it, it not only means he arose from the grave, which he did on the third day, but it means that his victory over death is a permanent victory. He will never have to die again. He faced death. He defeated death. He triumphed over it when he rose from the grave. And he will never again be crucified. I, I'm going to tell you this. He will never again be mistreated. He will never again be ridiculed. He will never again be spat upon. This past week in my devotions, I was retracing Passion Week, and I came across Matthew 27 where Matthew says the soldier stripped Jesus down, and they put this scarlet robe like a, like a king would supposedly wear, and they twisted the crown of thorns and pressed it into his head, and they put this stalk in his hand like a fake scepter. And they bowed down and they were mocking him saying, Hail King, Hail King of the Jews. And they spat on him. And then they took that scepter, that stalk, that reed. And they just started hitting him on the head. Striking him back and forth from every direction. And so much more. And when they'd mocked him, they took the robe off and put his own clothes back on him. They led him out to be crucified. Can I just tell you something? That happened once, but it will never, ever happen again. Never. Never going to happen. In fact, Jesus told us what the people of the world are going to do the next time they all see him, which I believe is separate from the rapture. It's when Christ appears to return. 
He says in Matthew 24, 30, these are Jesus' words, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. That's what all the peoples of the world are going to do. They're going to mourn. They're going to grieve. And they'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So you see, what we're saying is Jesus is never going to die again. He's alive forever and ever and ever. And he's not only alive in heaven, but one day he will manifest that he's alive when he returns to this earth. And your response to that really falls down to your relationship with him now. But here's the final reason for which we must not be afraid. (laughs) We cannot be afraid. And that is this. You ready for it? Jesus has the keys to your eternity. He has the keys to your eternity. Let's look in verse 18 again. He says, I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. Well, he said amen, but he throws in something else. He says, oh, and by the way, by the way, before I wrap this up, John, I have the keys of Hades and of death. I'm glad he threw that in as a P.S. (laughs) Death and Hades. It's an expression not only found here, it's found in the 6th chapter, in the 8th verse, 20th chapter, verses 13 and 14. One scholar called that expression, death and Hades, the twin forces of sin's curse. Now, there's a lot of debate about Hades. Everybody knows what death means. Death's when your heart stops. And we're all going to die one day unless, unless the Lord raptures us out of here. But some people believe the word Hades refers to a temporary abode of the dead, both saved and unsaved, and that each group will experience a resurrection in different sequences before entering their eternal destination, the saved to heaven, the unsaved to hell. Other people believe that Hades refers exclusively to the, interme- the intermediate place, kind of the holding tank, where the unsaved are kept in outer darkness, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth until the final judgment. And the final judgment would be the lake of fire. And, and the difference between the two is Hades is the temporary abode and Gehenna is the lake of fire or hell. Unfortunately, Hades is sometimes translated in our English translations as hell when it really is not hell. So you say, well, what do you think it is? Well, I'm not going to tell you what I think because I need some more time to figure all that out. But, I, <laughs> but I, I'd like to just be simplistic today to say this is what I think death and Hades refers to. I think death and Hades, when he says, I have the keys of death and hell, he's saying here, I have the keys to physical death and what comes after it. Physical death and the afterlife. Whether it is Hades for the unsaved before Gehenna at the white, great, uh, great White Throne, or Hades for the saved, which is paradise before the new Jerusalem, new heavens, all that. Uh, whatever it means is Jesus has the key to when you die and where you go after you die. Let's just, let's just put the cookies down on the lowest shelf here. He's got the keys. What does it mean to have the keys? Well, keys give access to what's behind the door. Jesus said, I have the keys. Can you say he has the keys? He's got the keys to what's behind the door. Keys also convey authority. You know, in this day and time, you see someone walking around with a bunch of keys, you know they work at a place where they're probably taking care of the building. But in ancient times, when someone carried big keys around, it it connoted that they had significant authority over something they owned or something they had been delegated to watch over. So you know, someone with keys can can get you in. And then keys suggest judgment. Why? Because if you've got a key, you can decide who you let in, who you don't. You can decide who you want to lock out because you got the keys. And because Jesus conquered death and because he emerged from Hades, the abode of the dead, he proved he's got victory over death and the grave. Death and the afterlife. And only Jesus Christ determines each person's experience with death. He's going to decide when you die. He's going to decide 
where you go when you die. It's already determined. He's got the keys. And I want to say if you're a believer in Christ, which means you've trusted in Jesus, he's your Lord and Savior, you know it beyond a shadow of a doubt. This is a great reminder to me that if he's got the key to my death, right, which means he's the one who's going to unlock the door of when I pass through, and he's got the key to my afterlife, which is the gates of heaven. He's got the key that unlocks the gates of heaven for me. If Jesus has the key, that means I'm not going anywhere until he's ready for me to go. That's a great reminder when you get up here in Atlanta, Georgia, and you get out on the open road. <laughs> right? You want to look in your rearview mirrors. You want to make sure you're an alert driver. You don't want to be a distracted driver, texting, driving. You don't want to take your life in your own hands. But the truth of the matter is, he's got the key to your death and to your afterlife. You're not going until he says it's time and he unlocks the door and you're out of here. That's why when, when, when COVID came around, I just thought, you know what? And I'm not trying to bash people, but I just thought I don't know enough about that. And so I said, and a lot of, I was made to feel like a criminal by people. like a redneck hillbilly science denier. But here was my view on it. I know him who has the keys to death in Hades. I'm not going anywhere until he wants me to go. And by the way, if you took it, we never talked about that here. I'm just telling you what's up inside this mixed up head. I, I, I'm just saying I know, I know who's got the key to my appointment. It's Jesus. And one of these days you're going to go, but not until he unlocks the door. He's got the keys to death in, in Hades. And the late Dr. John Walford, president of Dallas Theological Seminary, in his classic volume on Revelation, he says, As Christ possesses the key or authority over death, no man can die apart from his divine permission, even though afflicted by Satan in trial and trouble. So you see, not even the devil can take your life if you belong to Jesus. He has the keys of death. So don't be afraid of what the devil can do to you because you are in the hands of Jesus and Jesus has the key to the gates of heaven for his children. But what if you're not a believer? What if you're not saved? What if you don't even know what it means? We talk about being a Christian or being saved or being born again. All these expressions that you hear people using. Well, the, 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 the truth is he's got the keys for you too. See, the key, who's got the key determines who gets in and who's locked out. So what you've got to decide, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and by the way, you have no idea how happy we are, you are here today, if you don't know him. In fact, that's what I prayed would show up today, people who don't know Jesus. We, we want you to be here. We're glad you're here. But if he's got the key to death and the afterlife, your biggest decision is not figuring out how to get the key in your hand. Your biggest decision is what to do with Jesus. Because the keys aren't coming out of his hand. You've got to make him the Lord, the master, the boss, the one to whom you surrender. You've got to make him that in your life. The Bible even says in Romans 10, 9 that to be saved, as the Bible says, you have to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, which means you've got to make Jesus your Lord. And then it says you've got to believe in Easter. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that's Easter, you shall be saved. It doesn't say you can be saved or you might be saved. It says you shall be saved. So the biggest dilemma you face, whoever you are, wherever you are on the social spectrum, whether you ever come into this room again, your biggest dilemma is what are you going to do with Jesus? He loves you. He died for you, even though you don't even know that yet. I'm telling you, it was for you. He rose from that grave, which is what countless millions of Christians are celebrating all over the world today. But none of it means anything until he becomes yours. So you come here, and we've done our best to make this an awesome day. We wanted to create a resurrection experience that inspired hope in people's hearts but if you walk out these doors and you still don't know Jesus what good was all of this we want you to know Jesus we want you to give your heart and life to him and you say well I'm not ready to do that but wouldn't you even consider taking a, a few steps in that direction where you'd start learning more about him to figure out if this is what you need to do oh I wish I could get inside of your heart but I don't have the keys only he does and Jesus has the keys to your death 
and your afterlife. And if you don't go through him, I hate to tell you, the gates of heaven are locked shut. It's only through Jesus that the door is unlocked and open wide. And you know, I want to say something else to you. One thing we need to remember, he's the one that opens the door because he has the key to every opportunity we need in life. In this same book of Revelation, Jesus said to one of the churches, he said, John, I want you to write in chapter 3, he said, write to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David. And this is what Jesus is saying about himself. Jesus is saying that he is the one who opens and no one shuts. You see that? He shuts the door and no one can open it. I know your works, church. He says, I've set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, you've kept my word, and you've not denied my name. This is a great reminder to me. He not only has the keys of Hades and death, but he's got the key to every opportunity that I need. Every financial need, he can unlock the door of blessing. Every goal that you might have for your career, he has the key that can unlock that. Every relationship you want to have, he's got the key. Every dream you have for your future, he's got the key. He opens doors no man can shut. He closes doors no, man's, no man can open. So whether it is where you go when you die or every opportunity you need in this life, he's the only one. Who has the key? And may I just say this? I've walked through enough doors that I pried open with a crowbar <laughs> to make me say, Lord, if you didn't open it, I don't want to walk through it. The only doors that I want to walk through are the ones that he unlocked for me. Amen. So I want us to pray together with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. And I want to ask you with our heads bowed today, you're sitting out here to my right or to my left or in this center or maybe somewhere way back there in the back where I, I can't even see faces from this far away. But God knows you. He knows where you are in your life. He knows what your thoughts are about him. And he has you here, not because someone dragged you here or talked you into coming here or because you thought it'd be a good day to go to church. He has you here because he wants to know you and for you to know him. This is a divine appointment, and Jesus has the keys. And he's knocking on the door of your heart. And he's simply saying, let me in. Because you know what? You're the only one who can open that door to let him come inside. I'm praying you will do that. Can you just say in your own heart to Jesus, Jesus, I know that I need to be forgiven. Just tell him that. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for me. Jesus, I believe you were raised from the dead. Just tell him that. Jesus, I believe you are alive forevermore. And Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life. Take over. I give you control. Please come into my heart. Jesus, take your keys and unlock the door to eternal life for me that I may be a child of God. And if you prayed that prayer silently, privately between you and him, he heard your prayer. He's in heaven looking down on you. And out of all the people talking to him right now, he is able to drown everyone out but you. I don't know how he does it, but he does. And he heard your prayer. And if you meant it with your heart, he saved your soul and he's unlocked the door. Father, I thank you for speaking today in our Easter services. And I thank you for the way people have responded. And I know, 
I know without any doubt someone prayed to receive Christ today. We thank you for the way your spirit has worked in our service today. And we pray for those who trusted Jesus for the first time, that they will be led to pursue a, a Christian life of obedience, to grow in their faith and follow you all the days of their life. In Jesus' name, amen. And I would just like to, by faith, rejoice together with the people who just prayed to receive Christ. Would you do that? We have a decision room located directly behind the worship center. I know it's Easter. Everybody's got somewhere to go. But if you've got five to seven minutes, we'd love for you to come to the decision room and say, I prayed with the pastor today and I asked Jesus into my heart. Or you might go back there and say, I didn't pray. I was thinking about it, but I need someone to help me pray that prayer. They're there for you. You have no idea how much it would mean to them for you to do that. If you're watching us online, you can text the word Jesus to the number on the screen. Or if you'd prefer to email us, you can use our email address online at fba.org. Well, I believe we have celebrated the resurrection of Jesus in this place today. You need to go out and tell somebody, he's alive. God bless you.